All right, so we'll probably have a couple more people trickling in in the next couple minutes, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So good evening, everyone. My name is Albany and I'm with the city of Sunnyvale. Um, and on behalf of Bosca, our instructor Loretta, and our additional moderator Linda, I want to give everyone a warm welcome and I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Before we begin, I just want to go over some general housekeeping things um, to make sure that we have successful participation in tonight's workshop. First of all, all attendees are muted by default. Um, however, our instructor Loretta will pause periodically to address questions. Um, so there's two ways you can ask questions if you have any. First of all, you can use the raise hand feature. Um, and then we'll periodically pause uh, for questions, like I said, and then you can ask your question directly to Loretta. Second way you can ask questions is using the Q&A function. So on the bottom of your screen, you should see both the raise hand and the Q&A option. Um, you can just type any questions you have in the Q&A box. Um, Linda and I will help direct your questions to Loretta or we'll just answer them directly. Um, and then just want to note that we will not be using or checking the chat. So if you do have any questions, make sure to put them in the Q&A section, please. Um, I also want to note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available to all of you afterwards and it will be on our website. So next slide, please. I'm going to raise the hand in the Q&A. Perfect. Mm -hmm. yep. So a little bit about Bosca. Bosca represents 26 agencies, including cities, water districts, a water company, and a university that purchase water wholesale from the San Francisco Regional Water System. Uh, the Bosca member agencies provide water to 1.8 million people and over 40,000 businesses and community organizations in Alameda, Santa Clara, and San Mateo counties. The goal of Bosca is to provide high quality water at a fair price. <laughs> So consistent um, with this goal of Bosca, um, Bosca provides a regional water conservation program to support its agencies on improving water use efficiency. And the landscape education program is one element of that conservation program. And then to go over the program objectives of Bosca, first of all, outdoor water use represents the single largest untapped opportunity for water conservation in the Bosca service area. And second of all, outdoor water use reduction through the use of water efficient plants and innovative techniques can help conserve water and ensure that future, that future water supply needs of our communities are met. So although we've made significant strides in water use efficiency in the past decade or so, there's still more room for improvement. And then next slide, please. Um, a few highlights on additional conservation programs that may be of interest to you all. Um, so the Lawn Be Gone program provides rebates to customers of participating water agencies for replacing um, things in their lawns with water efficient landscaping replacements. The rebate is $1 to $4 per square foot of lawn replaced. The Bosco, Bosco also has a rain barrel program which provides rebates of up to $200 for purchase and installation of rain barrels. And then um, a new addition for Bosca is the Smart Controller Program, um, which provides instant rebates and heavily discounted pricing on the purchase of Ratio 3 Irrigation Controller, which is this little device you see there. Um, the controller can be operated on your smartphone, normally retails for $280, but through this program, customer, customers of participating water agencies can buy it for $100 plus tax. And then last but not least, look out for Bosca's redesigned landscape program, the landscape rebate program. It provides and incorporates our current LBG and rain barrel rebates. Um, that's LBG is the lawn be gone, by the way. And it also adds additional incentives for stormwater retention features. And for more information on any of these things I mentioned, you can go to bayareaconservation.org. Next. And then look out for our upcoming and final Bosco workshop of the season. On December 16th at 7 p.m., we will be going over rainwater harvesting. So stay tuned. <laughs> 
And then one more thing, if you're looking for additional resources on water efficient landscaping, head over to bayareagardening.org or the WaterWise Gardening website. Um, this supports residents in water efficient landscape renovations and management. And some of the resources on here include a gallery of gardens with plants identified as a plant selection tool and it also has a watering calculator for you to use. Okay, so some additional ways to save water in Sunnyvale. First off, we have a landscape rebate program, which offers rebates for replacing lawns and plants that require a lot of water with drought tolerant plants or permeable hardscape. And you can get up to $1 per square foot using this rebate. We also have the iHeart Gray Water Program. So properties that connect a clothing washer to a gray water irrigation system are eligible for a rebate for up to $200. And then one more thing, if you're looking to compost in Sunnyvale, um, it's available for Sunnyvale residents at our Smart Station. Smart Station is open from 8 to 5 on weekdays, and you can bring your own shovel and container to get compost that you need for your garden. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Linda with the City of Milpitas. I um, just wanted to talk about some of the rebates that we offer, similar to um, Sunnyvale, we work with Valley Water on the landscape rebate program. We do cost share, so Milpitas residents do get $2 per square foot of lawn replaced with drought tolerant plants. Um, a rebate that I think would be especially interested to gardeners would be our irrigation equipment upgrade rebate. And then we also offer rainwater capture rebates and the, the gray water rebate that Albany mentioned as well. You can learn more at savewatermilpitas.org. I do want to clarify that if you are a Milpitas or Sunnyville resident, um, the Valley Water is the organization that will be in charge of those rebates. But if you have a different agency in the Bosca, check the Bosca website or your retailers to see what offers are available. Okay. All right, so it's time to jump into our program. Um, Linda and I, like I said, we will be happy to answer any questions that you have on rebate quest on rebate options using the Q&A chat option. So feel free to type any questions in there. And now I'm very excited to introduce our instructor, Loretta. Loretta, Loretta has been an avid gardener for most of her life, having grown up with an annual backyard vegetable um, garden. She's the co-founder and garden manager of Pacifica Gardens, a community run urban farm on the San Mateo coast. Her training includes permaculture design and biointensive mini farming. So Loretta, take it away. Right. Thank you so much, Albany and, um, and Linda. So uh, welcome everybody. It's like the week before Thanksgiving. So thinking about what you're gonna do with your garden is uh, um, uh, sometimes, <laughs> You know, maybe not something that we're all thinking of at the same time, uh, but congratulations. Uh, so I just want to, a couple of things at, um, I'm going to turn my uh, video off here because my, um, um, my, uh, there we go, here we go. Um, my, um, my internet is a little bit unstable sometimes. So, um, but welcome. And uh, I just want to um, introduce what we're going to do for the next 45 or 50 minutes. This is designed uh, to be sort of an introduction to um, backyard gardening, edible gardening. This year has been unprecedented in terms of people being interested in starting gardens in their own backyard. First of all, we were all um, told to stay home and many of us had children and so many gardens were started over the, in the last uh, few months in the last year or so um, I'm assuming there might be um, some of you in that um, in that mode so um, we are going to talk about just the basics here but the first thing that we want to um, um, talk about is all right there you go some keys. So if you're planning your garden right now and you've never gardened before, this is a great opportunity for you to create a garden um, uh, from scratch using WaterWise uh, techniques. Um, not only equipment, but then also to just some very basic low tech type things that you can do to enhance your um, water saving strategies. So we can, the how we plan the garden. 
Um, soil improvement is one of those things that um, most people don't associate with, um, with saving water, but it very much is. Healthy living soil um, holds water. Um, we can we'll also discuss a couple of methods that will help minimize your water use. It sounds kind of interesting. And one thing that we want to talk about is watering effectively and efficiently. And the last thing is that we want to make sure that we are protecting the soil throughout the year. So when we protect the soil, we avoid um, erosion and um, we avoid loss of nutrients uh, and we keep the soil um, and we keep the soil living. One thing that we want to sort of talk about is avoid using overhead sprinklers. I think it's pretty common knowledge right now that using overhead sprinklers um, um, actually wastes quite a bit of water. If we're, in our, if we're in our garden, we end up watering things that don't really need water. So we recommend for our backyard gardeners to use um, either hand water or use a drip irrigation, both and or both. Um, also, um, using organic mulch uh, will help um, preserve the water in your garden beds. And so there's all different types of mulches that you can use. You can start collecting your leaves as they're falling off of your trees right now. Uh, you can use straw, pine straw, and you know, coconut coir are all good things that we can use for mulch. We, um, again, compost is really important. Uh, compost will help, wa uh, will help hold the water. And again, we really only want to water when our plants need it. So having the farmer in the garden is an excellent way to make sure that we're not overwatering our garden, which would be wasting water, um, or underwatering, which would then um, um, obviously the, the garden would suffer. And we want to make sure that we're going to be watering slowly so that and deeply so we avoid uh, runoff. <clears throat> We can do a couple of things um, that will optimize um, our um, the the soil itself, the water moisture. If we use optimum um, bed spacing or in bed spacing when we plant our our um, our vegetable plants, what we'll see is that I've got my little thing right here. Here's my plant here, and I'm planting it on this hexagonal type of pattern right here. As my plant, and I think this is lettuce, grows, they're barely touching each other. This, right, um, the plants themselves will create sort of a natural shade and protect the soil and also will keep the, um, uh, keep the weeds down, okay? So we can optimize um, our, our uh, in-bed place, um, our in-bed spacing. We can flat our own seeds and transplant our own seedlings. It seems like how could that possibly save water, but I'll talk and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we can plant vegetables that have high water content requ requirements together. Okay, so if you're going to plant pumpkins, all right, and zucchini, which are high water content, we'll get them planted together um, so that that bed will um, that that's the bed that will will, leave, will need more water, and then the other vegetables will need less water. So we're actually going to be saving um, saving water with planting just by separating some of these plants. Weed regularly to prevent competition for water. Okay, I know weeding, yeah, All right. So the weeds themselves, they they compete for water, and we want to make sure that with that they are um, um, minimized. And don't over fertilize. Now, when we're first starting, and I've had this experience myself, when we're first starting to uh, garden, we tend to, oh, you know what, this this soil, um, you know, really needs some fertilizer. So, you know, a little bit is good, but more is better. Not necessarily. What we'll end up doing is growing huge plants, and which will. Um, you know, take a lot of water, um, but we don't necessarily get um, the the production of, of of the vegetable that we really want. For instance, beans. Right? You can grow the giant bean stalk, um, but that's not going to necessarily improve the number of beans that you get. So, just we need to take we need to think of fertilizing as part of our water saving strategy. And then, of course, if we, as um, Albany and uh, um, and Linda have talked about, the rain barrels, right? To, we want to make use of free water. So let's talk a little bit about garden planning. The first thing we want to, to consider is your garden size, right? Um, how big, you know, how much of your yard do you want to dedicate to your um, to your edible um, garden? We want to locate um, our garden beds in the right space with an, uh, uh, with the right amount of sunlight. And we want to then take into consideration and decide what type of garden beds that we'd like. Do you want raised beds? Do you want in-ground beds? Do you need to use containers? 
right? And we need to talk a little bit about bed size, okay? All right, so, and then of course we have, a, we need to create a watering, uh, watering plan. So I always tell people that when we're first starting to grow our own vegetable garden in the backyard or in the front yard, wherever you are, begin small. And, and um, I can also speak from experience here. When I moved here 20 years ago, I live on the, um, the San Mateo coast. I just decided I was gonna convert my whole backyard into a vegetable garden. And I just, you know, I hadn't, you know, had a garden, uh, a, a garden that big and I kind of, you know, it, got away from me, right? So start small. You want to set yourself up for success. And you might just want to start with one or two beds, okay? Um, or if you um, just are, if you're interested in doing container gardening or gardening in barrels or something like that, you can just start out with a couple of those. And expand your garden, thinking about how might I expand it, you know, but expand your garden when you begin to have success, right? And develop some confidence. The last thing that you want to do is to have a huge garden that is too, um, you know, more to take care of than you thought was going to, and then you get disappointed, all right? And then, um, and then you won't do it the following year. So start small, be successful, and then expand, um, and then expand after that. And, you know, I, I make the suggestion, maybe begin with a couple of three by three beds. That's, those are um, uh, good ways to begin. When you're selecting your garden site, consider how much sunlight you're going to get. All right, so we need to find a sunny location. Um, and so kind of we live in the northern hemisphere. So the ideal um, site or the ideal location for our, our garden beds is going to be a southwest exposure. Right, so in the summer, when we're thinking about the summer months, okay, we're and here's the house here. All of this over here is going to be our 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 um, uh, the southwest, right? We get a lot of sun here. If we're planting on the north side, okay, we can see that we don't actually are are not actually going to um, um, uh, get as much sun, okay. So taking into consider uh, consideration where your house is, okay. So if you look, you're looking at your garden, we wanna make sure that we find a location where we're gonna get a minimum of eight hours, right, during the main growing season. Now, the main growing season, what is that? Okay, so the main growing season is really after the, the time of the, the space of the time between the last frost, okay and the first frost and for us here in the bay area we're talking about you know late march early april right and to you know um late september sometimes mid-october okay so we have a pretty long growing season here um in the bay area and so that does give us plenty of time okay so when you're looking right now is not the time to look for eight hours of sun because the days are getting shorter and shorter so when you know you're still um when you're planning your garden this year or in the springtime start watching and looking and seeing where the sun is right and where it sets okay okay wind okay so take into consideration wind wind um will dry your garden all right it's hard on vegetable gardens it also causes water evapor evaporation so sometimes an open a big open space you think oh this will be great but it'll be it's super windy all right so um you might want to um create um some uh, wind screens if necessary um, or look for a place that's going to give you the optimum of, you know, less wind and more sun. We don't always have those options, but those are things that we want to consider. We always have to consider our urban wildlife. So um, deer and other wildlife are going to be roaming um, uh, around our gardens. Uh, we do have to deal with uh, the, um, the wildlife. There is no doubt about it. We're going to have birds to deal with. Sometimes we have raccoons. Sometimes we have deer. Right. If you can build your garden so that you'll be protecting uh, your garden from your urban wildlife, um, that's a great idea. Okay. So um, I, um, in the past, I've had to fence off my garden from my dogs because they were great gardeners. They would always help me harvest things, uh, usually before I wanted them to be. There are three basic types of garden beds, raised beds, the in-ground beds that we just dig in the soil and plant, and then containers. And we're gonna talk about the advantages and disadvantages of all three of them. Raised beds 
are um, easy access for a gardener. So what is a raised bed, right? So you ac you're actually going to make a box or a circle or however you want to uh, with, with uh, um, uh, lumber or bricks or um, stones. And then you're gonna fill up that box with soil and then plant into it. Raised beds um, are um, create a situation where it is really much easier for the gardeners. Okay, um, we then have the ability to create optimal soil texture. Okay, sandy versus clay. So if you live in a really uh, have really, um, have a lot of clay soil, if you uh, have a lot of rocky soil, um, you know maybe you want to consider doing a raised bed. Um, the idea of having a raised bed also allows you to put in a screen, a gopher screen on the bottom of the beds, which will then help um, keep gophers uh, from um, getting um, into your beds. And, and honestly, uh, raised beds is much easier to install an irrigation system. The size of your, if you're going to do raised beds, okay, the size of your raised bed should be a minimum of three by three, so three feet by three feet, right? This will create the optimal plant synergy and, um, and water conservation, right? Um, four by four, I wouldn't really make them any wider than four feet. I have seen them um, up to five feet, but as soon as you get past four feet, it becomes difficult to work in those beds without climbing in them. And that's the one thing that you want to avoid. Okay, so smaller beds and containers can be used um, if you, if you know, um, uh, uh, con you know, smaller containers that if you have barrels or large pots, we can use those for leaf crops and smaller plants. Um, but the larger plants are going to be producing quite a few vegetables like zucchini, tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, beans. Um, those types of vegetables really are going to require a bed type of a thing. They can grow in pots, right, or barrels, but they, you don't, you, it's not optimal for them. Take into consideration your path space. Okay, so we need to allow enough room to work. A lot of times uh, we want to go, oh, you know, I, I really want to get as many beds in there as possible. Pretty soon you've only got a foot apart, okay. Um, which is fine, you can walk through that, but you can't get a wheelbarrow through there. If you feel like you're gonna need to um, uh, use a wheelbarrow to uh, bring compost into your garden beds, make sure that you can get a wheelbarrow through your paths, okay? Your paths should be porous, okay? We don't wanna concrete over them, right? So path space um, can be ground cover, stepping stones, gravel, or chips, okay? And we do not want to concrete our path spaces. That, that creates a, just a, you know, all kinds of water runoff and waste, okay? Digging in ground beds. Okay, so this is the old fashioned way. This is us at Pacifica Gardens early on. We have a lot of raised beds now, but we used to, um, we have a lot of clay soil. We used to uh, double dig all of our beds, which was great. Um, however, most of us are now uh, 55 or older. And um, we recently um, had a huge project where we put, a, uh, we put raised beds in. But the, the advantages to an ingra, um, a bed that's dug into the ground, first of all, it's really inexpensive. You just, you know, mark off your bed and you start and, and you, you dig it, you loosen up the soil, you apply some compost and then you're ready to go. Okay, it's long lasting, um, you know, the, you know, wood will eventually wear out, stones eventually, you know, kind of move around. Um, but um, inexpensive and long lasting, the plant root systems have full access to the soil. There's no barriers, okay. Um, and it is easy to integrate your in-ground beds with your ornamental garden design. So if you want to say, for instance, in your front yard, you have an area where, hey, you know, I can plant um, some vegetables here um, tucked in between some of my ornamentals. And uh, so, you know, digging into the ground and planting your edibles in str straight into the ground, you know, actually um, is, is quite easy. Okay, and then also too, your crops can wander. I don't know if anybody's ever planted a pumpkin uh, recently, but those plants tend to wander everywhere. Um, and so they do very well in in-ground beds. And that's how we plant our pumpkins at Pacifica Gardens. Container gardening. So let's talk just a little bit about uh, container gardening. Container gardening is a really kind of a specialized um, gardening technique. <laughs> um, it, it, um, 
uh, first of all, I just want to say container gardening is not really the most water wise way to, um, to garden. However, it, some, for some people, it may be the only way that they can, they can garden. And there are some things that you can do to prevent water loss, okay? So, so um, you know, the thing that's really nice about container gardening is if you, if you have a small deck, if you live in an apartment, um, or if you, know, if you just are not um, physically able to work in garden beds, um, uh, container gardening in large pots can really offer a lot of gardening satisfaction. Okay. And of course, you don't run into uh, gophers and moles. Okay. Again, we want to place our containers or um, 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 on porous. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. That's why. Okay. Well, I just want to say this: containers and small beds that are placed on non-porous or concrete patios are less water efficient. Okay. Than other planting options. Okay. So, I personally like uh, clay pots for my uh, for my my um, container gardening. I know that we have now these sort of fabric um, pots that people are using. I can tell you they take a lot of water. Um, unless somebody has um, other ideas, um, I did plant um, a number of them today, or I mean this past spring, just to see how they would work. They do, they do great in terms of growing things, but they, the, unfortunately they do take a bit more water. Uh, the clay pots or the um, um, old wine barrels, they will actually hold the water better. Create your watering plan at the very beginning. Try to figure out how you're going to water it. So if you go out to your backyard, where is my water source and how am I going to get it to my garden beds? Am I just going to put, put my hose up to it and hand water? Absolutely, you can do that, okay? Um, if you want to consider uh, putting in a drip irrigation, consider how you wanna, how you wanna do that, okay? Um, you may wanna do a combination. Um, we actually do a combination of uh, drip irrigation and hand watering um, at Pacifica Gardens. Uh, so most of our, or all of our raised beds have, um, have drip irrigation. I put it on just sort of a, a low amount of uh, water. I think it's like 15 minutes um, a day. And then, um, and then we check the beds every afternoon to make sure that the beds are, are moist enough. And then that way we can actually adjust how much water a certain bed needs. For instance, cucumbers are gonna need more water than, oh, I don't know, lettuce, okay? All right, so create some sort of a watering plan for yourself. So whatever you choose, create beds that allow um, freedom for the root systems to grow deep into the soil, right? The, make sure that your beds are accessible to, to you, all right, and anybody else who's, um, who's gardening. Make sure that your beds have good drainage, right? And they're pretty easy to irrigate, okay? And um, you can be um, very creative. This um, is uh, this image right here. We had an AmeriCorps team a few years ago come and help rebuild our herb spiral. And we used urbanite, which was just reclaimed concrete. And we put it in circles here. And now the, um, this is actually all planted up now with, um, uh, with, uh, with herbs. Okay, so soil preparation. The biggest thing about soil is that the soil needs to have uh, sufficient organic matter, okay, and living organisms. So living soil, okay. The living soil with um, organic matter will hold water and provide optimal growing environment for your plants, okay. So if you, um, the number one thing you should be thinking about right now is what kind of soil am I going to use and or how am I going to improve my soil if it needs to be improved. Okay, we want to again create living soil. So as some of you already may already know, the best garden soil is sort of a mixture of the three soil particles. I'm sure everybody's heard about sand, silt, and clay, and they are optimally, you know, for garden beds, um, approximately 30 to 50% sand, 30 to 50% um, silt, right, and 20 to 30% clay. However, that does not mean if you have a lot of clay, if you have more than 30% clay in your garden, that, that, that you can't have a productive garden. In fact, clay is very high in minerals, even though it can be a little bit of a problem initially, um, when you start adding your compost and creating life in your soil, a clay soil um, is, is actually um, um, 
um, quite um, productive, okay? The other thing is we wanna make sure that we do try to get somewhere between five and 10% of organic matter in, um, uh, in our soil. Okay, so the living soil organisms that bind uh, soil particles, create, um, maintain uh, pore space, and they feed the root systems of the plants. Okay, so how are, what are these living organisms? Okay, so we think of them, we see them, oh, worms, right? But there's also um, the other living organisms within our soil are going to be just a whole host of bacteria. And, um, and fungi that are gonna create what we call a soil food web, right? That can, well, um, optimize um, nutrient exchange between the plants, all right, and the soil. So for your in-ground beds, um, you probably want to examine your soil and there's ways that you can do that. You can test it, and I recommend that. Depend, and also, um, you might want to test for toxins if, if you feel like your area may have been exposed to lead or um, you know, other toxins. Um, and then initially, you're probably you're going to need to break up the, um, the compaction optimally to about 24 inches and, and, and probably double dig it. And then add about a half an inch to one inch of, of uh, compost, OK? Raised beds, um, you get to fill them, right? You're gonna fill those raised beds with purchased, right? Or found um, soil, right? Usually topsoil. And I'd recommend that we get it from a reliable garden supply source, okay? Um, even though um, your, when you fill up a new bed, you have new topsoil, you are gonna still need improvement um, with compost, right? And, and, and living if you can possibly, if you can get it. Okay. Um, okay. And generally, and the reason why um, you want um, the advantages of raised beds is that after the beds have been prepared and after you have um, um, organic matter in there, they usually don't need to be, quote, dug um, very much, just um, loosened up a little bit. One thing that we know is the uh, whole farming industry right now is going through this no-till um, um, sort, sort of um, idea, which is that we wanna um, disturb the soil as little as possible once we have it the way we, the, the way we want it, okay? So if we get our soil uh, with uh, plenty of compost in it and we get the, the living organisms in there, uh, we weed it on a regular basis, we can plant our plants in there, and then we don't really have to do a lot of digging, okay? For our pots and our small containers, we're gonna fill the, them up with soil, um, uh, soil mixes specifically um, designed for container gardening. And there are many um, Omri listed um, organic um, um, soil mixes that are really good for, uh, for containers and that we sell them all over the Bay Area. Um, you can make your own soil if you want, if you use um, you know, about half uh, sandy loam and about half compost. So generally, and just if you're gonna do a container garden, um, generally um, understand that um, it will take more compost and organic fertilizer because the space for the root systems is limited, okay? So we don't have, these are my strawberries, right? These are my strawberries this, this spring. Um, you know, they're gonna, those, these roots here are gonna bump into the walls of this, okay? And so they require a little bit more work than if I just had them in my regular bed. I use the least amount of amendments and fertilizers as I possibly can get away with, okay? Um, there are lots of really good quality organic amendments and fertilizers on the, on the market. I specifically, I like alfalfa meal, right? When, when I, um, after I amend my beds with my compost every spring, I usually add some alfalfa meal. Okay, um, a kelp is also a good one. Sometimes the alfalfa meal and the kelp together. Okay, and if you find that um, you're not getting what you want from your um, from your soil or your vegetables, you can use a, um, a sort of a general all vegetable um, uh, fertilizer. Right. So there's lots of companies that do um, that um, that produce those. Okay. Um, once you have your garden bed ready to go, it should not be exposed um, or left empty for very long, okay? Empty beds lose moisture. 
one of the things that that's a concept that sometimes when we're first starting to begin we don't understand that we want once we've created us a, a soil environment that is full of organic matter that is full of living organisms we actually want to keep it that way and we need to keep it moist okay so i use all right we use shade net okay so this is a bed of cabbages that we planted earlier in the year and um, we use a shade net over um, initially right after we finish planting so that it protects the seedlings and lets them get um, um, used to the soil okay so protect your soil um, it's you know you've gone to a lot of work to get it um, in, in, in a good place so protect it okay so um, now is a good time if we want to um, answer some questions. Um, yes, absolutely. We do have quite a couple questions. Okay. So we can just do a couple now and then save some for later. Okay. So okay. first off, um, do we need to do anything special to collected leaves in order to use them as mulch? Or can we just collect them and spread them as they are? Oh, nope, you can just collect them and spread them as they are, okay? So um, obviously if you're um, out on your street, you just wanna make sure that you don't have any trash or anything, you know, that's, um, but um, um, I don't live in, a, in, in an environment anymore where leaves just fall off the trees and I can collect them. But when I lived in Fremont for 40 years, um, we used to sweep up the, um, rake up the leaves and put them in several um, trash cans and then just set them on the side of the, of the yard until I was ready to use them. Great, that's a good tip. Um, on that same note, can we do the same with compost items? Can we just throw them right on top or do we need to mix them in any certain way? Yes. Um, so um, in terms of uh, composting itself is a whole different conversation. Um, but um, if you are um, uh, wanting to create your own compost, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the next section, um, there's, you need to like get a composter and put together um, a composting system. Um, you don't want to take things that are like high nitrogen, sort of kitchen scraps and just sort of dump them somewhere. They will become slimy, okay, and anaerobic. Um, leaves um, and um, pine needles, straw, uh, the only thing that you need to kind of be aware of is those just maybe just keep them from getting wet, um, but you can't just, um, you can't um, store um, kitchen scraps. You need to put them into a composting system right away. I hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. Um, one more question and then we can save the rest for later. Um, okay. I know you mentioned that your dogs like to help you garden. Um, what about like neighborhood cats or squirrels? Um, are they gonna also get into the garden? And if yes, what can we do about it? <laughs> um, yeah, I know uh, squirrel, uh, squirrels and cats. Um, so, um, uh, I have a squirrel um, in my backyard, and you know it really um, it really doesn't cause too much damage. They just um, uh, come in and dig around the beds, and then and then they leave. Um, but um, it's the cats, right? The cats tend to um, uh, jump into the beds. The um, the only way I know to keep out squirrels and cats is to create one of those beds that are similar to um, one I showed a few slides back that actually like is kind of fenced off and then you put a top on it and that's how you can keep the cats out. I know a number of people in Pacifica that have a, a setup like that. They do it actually to keep the to keep a, a deer out and also raccoons out. Uh, so um, let me just jump back real quick on this slide in here and Okay, and does this also work for gophers? Um, no, um, gophers, um, uh, so this, this slide right here has, um, has a top to it, okay, so, think, so we can actually keep things out. Um, gophers, now on the raised beds, okay, um, you'll put um, screen underneath it, okay? If you uh, to screen the gopher screen, you can use one of two things. One is something that's actually designed for um, it's called gopher screen, 
and it's one half inch galvanized hex mesh. It doesn't, um, uh, not everybody sells it, okay? And, you, and it's easy to confuse that with aviary wire or chicken, uh, or chicken wire. They're not the same, okay? So make, if you are gonna use one of those products to screen the bottom of your bed for gophers, make sure that it's gopher screen. It's like I said, it's, it's half inch galvanized um, a hex mesh. The other thing, and the one that I like better, is the half inch galvanized hardware cloth. It's also a mesh, but it's square. Um, I think it's a lot sturdier. And you can get the, um, you can get the hardware cloth in three foot widths, four foot widths, five foot widths, and I think you can order it at six foot widths. So for my beds that I have in my garden, these beds right here, these are at, at, our, at the big garden. These, this is a four foot wide bed. We used four foot wide um, uh, screen underneath it. So when we look at the bed, it's only like the four sides of the bed. The bottom is actually has no wood at all, right? It just has the screen tacked onto it with, um, with the staples. Loretta, one um, clarifying question on the compost was when you have your compost, do you mix it in in the bed or layer it on top? Oh, okay. I think I misunderstood the question. Yeah. So when, you, um, when you're preparing, okay, so once I put it, once I, um, uh, I'm all finished digging, I'm going to put my half inch or my uh, uh, half to half inch to one inch of compost on top of the soil. When I'm here, I'll, I'm not going to dig it in all the way down to 24 inches. I'm just going to put it on top and kind of just flick it in maybe to, you know, lightly with the fork until uh, about four inch deep. And then after that, that's fine, right? It doesn't need to go all the way down. Does, is, does that help with the question? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, all right. So let's let's go on. Um, if you're a new to gardening and you don't know the first thing about compost, um, you can go to. I'm pretty sure Alameda. They used to anyway. <laughs> And I know that San Mateo County, they have um, um, ways in which um, they have classes, okay? And there's tons and tons of online videos that you can watch as well. Learn to make your own compost, okay? Um, we have opportunities uh, through um, different agencies um, to get compost, and that's great. But the, um, um, and the, um, an important way to help um, uh, with waste reduction is for you to make your own compost, plus your compost will be living and you'll know what's in it, okay? So um, the, um, okay, so um, if you don't know how to make compost, unfortunately we don't have time to go through how to make a pile, um, but um, hopefully um, we'll have opportunities in the future. So as I always say, composting in your backyard garden is the number one thing that you can do to improve your soil, grow healthy vegetables, and save water, okay? Um, home composting is gonna reduce waste. Um, it's full of beneficial organisms, bacteria, fungi, and earthworms. And it allows you to select the materials for your compost piles. Sometimes there are some things you just don't want in your compost, in your compost piles. I mean, berries and thorns and different things, okay? And then you can control completely the, um, the materials, the organic materials that you um, put into your compost pile. And I've been composting for a very, very long time. Um, it's, once you learn how to do it, it's really easy, okay? So compost is just decomposed organic matter. Okay, and it's our natural process of recycling organic materials, right? Leaves and vegetable scraps, right? And that will turn into um, black gold. So good compost is gonna provide nitrogen and carbon, right? Sugars and carbohydrates and other nutrients to grow healthy organic vegetables. Compost reduces the need for chemical fertilizers. And this is an important concept. 
in terms of organic, um, uh, growing organic vegetables, okay? Um, you know, when you get, when you grow your own compost, when you make your own compost, when you add it, once your soil is living, um, you don't really need a lot of additives, okay? Sometimes you need some, sometimes, you know, but you, you use less and less, okay? And like I said, over and over and over again, compost is gonna improve your soil, right? Which is gonna grow healthy plants, all right? And healthy plants, um, uh, resist, right, pest and diseases. And as I said, compost is going to save water. Okay, let's talk a little bit about planting, right? So uh, seeds, transplanting, and in-bed spacings. So I think it's really, really rewarding to propagate your own seeds, okay? It's very easy to go, you can go to the, the nursery and buy um, your organic starts, and that's great. And maybe the first couple of gardens that you have, that's what you wanna do. But one of the things that you can do is you can propagate, there's plenty of um, great um, seed companies that have, um, uh, have open pollinated organic seeds. Um, but growing your own seedlings is very rewarding, okay? And actually, if we do them in small pots or flats, okay we save water okay we, these are beans that are like one inch apart all right so i've got six of them in a four inch pot they're going to grow up to about two or three inches high and then i'm going to put them in the garden bed okay so what we'll end up doing is overall rather than putting the seeds straight into the soil and then watering the entire bed okay i'm going to be watering this flat of seeds that are only one inch apart and then when i'm going to take each individual plant out and then plant it six or seven inches apart and then i can water and then i'll water that so this taking this extra step here propagating your own seeds helps save water the other thing is is that your your germination rate will improve and then you and allows you to transplant the healthiest plants so if i've got six seeds in here and you know, um, all, they all come up, but one of them doesn't really like look all that healthy. Yeah, I just put that in the compost and now I've, I'll plant the other five, okay? So now I've selected for the healthiest plants um, in my garden. Okay, in addition to water, <clears throat> we're gonna, we get more choices of vegetables. So when we go to the nursery in the spring, the nursery will have whatever they, you know, whatever they've chosen, okay? But if you get a hold of, you know, um, Territorial Seed Company's cart, um, catalog or go to Peaceful Valley Farm Supply or, you know, um, or go to Johnny's Seed Company, these are all reputable companies and you get their catalog, there's just like, you know, there's, you know, 50 kinds of tomatoes that you can get. So you have more choices of vegetables and you also have control over your planting schedule. So if you go to your regular nursery, you, you know, you, you, you buy what they have, which is great, but you got to get it in, okay? You, got, you can't just let it sit on your, um, you know, out on your patio and um, for weeks on end, they'll die. Um, I'll, I've done that. Um, but um, uh, so you can actually control your planting schedule a little bit if you are um, planting your own seeds, okay? And again, you're going to get healthier seedlings and, as I said, a huge sense of accomplishment. Then we're going to transplant. Okay, so I always say if this little five-year-old can transplant lettuce, so can you, okay? Right, your seedlings are ready to transplant into the garden when you have at least two true leaves, right? Sometimes three, and the plant is about two or three inches tall, okay? And we can see that um, we're transplanting these. I think these are lettuces, I'm not really sure. Um, we're planting them in this sort of a hex pattern here. Um, and the best um, time of the day to transplant is in the early evening, okay, late afternoon, early evening when the air is cool, okay, so when we're transplanting, and everybody or most everybody's going to be living here in, the, um, uh, in Alameda County and in uh, Santa Clara County, it's hot in the beginning of the day in the summertime. So plant in the evening when it's a little bit cooler, and then the plants will have nice cool evening uh, to get used to the soil. Planting in the middle of the day um, at the heat of the day is um, uh, really tough on your little transplants, okay? Um, and we wanna make sure that the soil is moist. This is a very f a frequent thing that new gardeners, a, fr a frequent mistake that new gardeners make is planting or transplanting their, their new seedlings into soil that is not moist enough, okay? 
So if you'll, you transplant into dry soil, um, it will, your seedling will suffer and it may, may not survive, okay? The, the wet, the dry soil will just literally suck the moisture right out of the, um, the root system, okay? So make sure that your soil is, um, is plenty moist. Okay, so vegetables have different spacing requirements, okay, depending on how big they get, right, depending on their root system, right, and how much light and water they need. So every single crop is going to require a different bed spacing. Um, so we, we're talking about inches, right, or feet, right, for instance, it's tomatoes, we should plant those puppies two feet apart. Pumpkins, we should plant those like two and a half to three feet apart, depending on the variety of, of pumpkin. But beets, we can plant those four inches apart. Bunching onions, we can plant them one inch apart. Okay, so knowing um, what, um, what, what bed spacing is optimal for your crop is gonna be important. And so plan ahead, right, um, on a piece of paper, draw out your bed and plan how you're gonna, how you're gonna plant things, okay? And like I said earlier, using the hexagonal spacing method is gonna maximize your garden space. Okay, so I've got, you know, it's act, you know, I've got these little tiny things right here. These are little lettuces as they grow up. Okay, they're gonna make their own sort of shade, if you will, protecting the soil, right? And optimizing the growth for the plants themselves. Okay. All right. Watering, our favorite thing. Okay. <laughs> Keeping the, uh, the soil mo moist is essential, okay, to maintaining the plant and the soil life. Now, <clears throat> when, we're, when we're trying to be water wise, you know, sometimes we think, well, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to water around the plant, okay, and that'll be sufficient. And then there'll be, you know, 12 inches or so of, that, of the soil is dry. So what happens is, is that there will be some living soil, all right, and then, and, and wet soil, and then outside of that, it will be dry. And very often, there, it won't have the nutrients, it won't have the plant, uh, have the soil life that's necessary. And you end up sort of dwarfing your plants, okay? And the soil itself becomes uneven in terms of its soil life, okay? So even though, you know, it seems like, you know, maybe it's not, you know, um, it seems, it, it, you know, counter um, whatever uh, to what we're thinking in terms of watering, if we make sure that we think we're, we water the soil, if you will, rather than the plant, the plants will do better. And, and, and at the end of the day, we will be saving water. Okay. All right. So the, um, what I tell people is usually there'll be lots of questions like, how do I know it's watered enough? I have no idea. This is the first time I've ever done this. Good question. Water, okay. And um, as you're watering, if you say you're hand watering, um, you'll see the soil. Well, obviously there will be water. It'll be kind of shiny. Pull the water away, okay. The water should actually go right into the soil. It should not run off, okay. Um, and then water it a little bit more and then let it soak in, okay? We wanna make sure that, and if, you know, and water slowly, okay? We wanna make sure that the water keeps sinking in. Now, if you get to a point where it doesn't sink in, okay, then we think, aha, I've got too much water at this point. Wait a half an hour or an hour, go back to your bed, and then kind of take a little shovel and dig down about four or six inches and you can feel the, feel the soil, kind of pull up a little bit, okay? And then take some soil in your hand and squeeze it. And if you open up your hand and the soil is clumped, okay, but not super wet and drippy, then that's good enough. If the soil is kind of falls apart, okay, that's a, that's a sign that you don't have enough water. Okay, that's a, just a really super low-tech way to know um, um, how to water, okay? All right, All right. so we've pretty much talked about um, in-ground beds and raised beds. Um, we can easily fit them to the irrigation system. Our pots and small containers um, are easily watered by hand. Um, and, and like I said, consider using both methods if, um, if you have a larger garden, All right? So it's effective and efficient. Okay, um, I'm a big, my backyard garden, I've been gardening for a long time. My backyard garden is a hand-watered garden. 
and um, I, um, I like it because it allows for even watering. Um, I can adjust the amount of water that I'm using depending on whether it's foggy or if it's raining. Um, and uh, there are some disadvantages to it. If I water at the wrong time of the day, I'm going to tend toward uh, water evaporation. And um, if I have to carry and I don't water deep enough until the time to test, Right? Sometimes I'll end up with uh, um, shallow root growth. Okay, but if you water, if you hand water well, okay, um, you um, it's actually quite um, it, it's it's quite efficient. Okay, um, these are my favorite kind of nozzle things to use. Um, so use a hand watering nozzle um, that's going to allow you to control and uh, uh, control the direction of the water stream. Um, and use settings that will deliver a gentle spray to the soil around the plants. This one right here um, is the one that Bosca gave me many moons ago. Of course, the one I have right now looks, you know, all dirty and everything like that. But that's a, um, it's a great one because it has multiple settings on it um, and so that you can get a nice little a gentle rain. Okay. All right, um, watering generally, the best time of day to water is at the end of the day. It doesn't, sometimes it doesn't sound very intuitive, but if you water at the end of the day, it's gonna help reduce um, the possibility for um, evaporation, okay? And it's gonna allow enough time for um, the leaves to dry and prevent um, mildew and fungus from forming on the leaves, okay. Avoid strong streams of water. That's sort of um, a kind of a natural um, thing. We want to avoid erosion, okay? That uh, can deserve, um, can disturb the plants. Drip irrigation, okay? So drip irrigation is, um, can be very efficient, right? It saves a lot of water by minimizing water evaporation. The water just literally drips right into the soil bed. The best time of the day is gonna be either in the early morning or at the end of the day. Right, and you can do plenty of deep watering, okay? Right, and it also allows you to water your garden when you're not home. Now, if you are beginning, I, you know, you may want to do drip irrigation. You might want to start doing hand watering and then create a drip irrigation plan for yourself. It's up to you. I have, there are some disadvantages to drip irrigation, just want to make sure everybody knows what they are. Occasionally, the water, depending on how you arrange your tubing, Right, sometimes we get uneven watering, okay, and the repairs, okay, all right, so they do break and they do need to be replaced, okay, and they do make this hex planting idea a little bit more challenging, okay. Um, the drip irrigation, I mean, there are definitely some you know, reasonable packages, no doubt, right, but there is an expense for it, okay. okay. All right, so we don't really have that much time to talk about um, crops. It's about eight o'clock right now, but I just wanna go through just a couple of ideas. So when you're planning, plan your garden, okay? Um, what, do you want to, what do you want to eat? Don't, don't try to grow something that you don't wanna eat. So if nobody in your family likes kale, even though kale is supposed to be good for you, then you might not wanna plant it. But if you know that your kids are gonna eat strawberries and tomatoes and cucumbers, those are really great things um, uh, to want to have you know, in your garden, okay? So think of the things that you want, okay? During the main growing season, and again, we talked about that main growing season being between uh, the two frosts, okay? Um, plant what we call the warm weather crops. So those are all of your, beans and your squashes and your corn and all of those things we associate with summer, okay? You can plant root crops in succession. So if you wanna plant carrots and beets and onions, right? So you can plant several of those crops in succession. So start a crop of carrots, right? A couple rows of carrots, wait about three or four weeks, plant another row, and eventually you, what you do is that with successive planting, you can end up with vegetables, right, throughout the year or extended um, harvests. Leaf crops are great, um, especially if you have kids, you can um, uh, go out there and you can cut off lettuce leaves or spinach leaves or chard leaves, that kind of thing, and they last for several months, okay? And in the fall, right, you can plant your cool weather crops. So those are, are gonna be your lettuces and your spinaches and your 
chard and your kale and your cabbage and all those kinds of things. So you can plan to grow food all year round if you want, or maybe you just want to grow in the summertime. Okay, all right, it's up to you. I always like to encourage people to plant things for um, soil protection and sustainability. And um, this idea that at, at the end of the growing season, if you're not going to have a fall garden, plant some what we call cover crop. Okay, so any bed that's not going to have um, a, a cool weather crop in the fall should have, um, have cover crop planted in it. So what's cover crop? Cover crop is usually a mix of legumes, right, and grains, okay, that are going to add um, uh, nutrients into the soil, protect the soil. Right? And you can either dig it in and sort of green manure if you want, or you can take it out in the spring and compost it. Okay, okay so things for sustainability. Okay, sunflowers, corn, fava beans, and other legumes, right? These are all crops that are going to help produce carbon uh, for your compost piles. And sunflowers are really pretty. They, you know, the birds love them, right? The kids love them. And the bees love them. Okay, so these are um, um, as you're sort of planning um, your garden things that you might want to incorporate. Okay, and I just want to say one last thing. The most important thing is to have fun. Okay, um, this is um, a, an interesting time in our life right now. Um, I've been in conversation with um, plenty of um, parents who have been trying to figure out how to incorporate some backyard gardening with their children during the pandemic and they've done all different kinds of things. I've gotten great pictures of kids picking tomatoes and, and strawberries and um, harvesting lettuce for the salad and it's a, it's a great family um, thing that you can do. Um, it helps um, um, children learn um, proper eating habits and um, it gives them a huge um, sense of accomplishment and it's a great family activity. So the last slide here and um, are the resources from which I uh, created uh, this slide presentation. There are tons and tons of really great garden books out there, many of them are organic. We'll find out soon enough that everybody has a different way of wanting to garden. Okay. The best thing to do is to try something um, and see if it works. And if you get what you want and you've had a good time, then great, right? Just because it's different than some, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a so-called expert said, um, it's um, uh, it's your garden and create um, what, what you would like. Okay, and that is that. So I'm going to stop share here. And Thanks. Thanks so much, Loretta. So at first, I do want to recognize that it is 8.06, so if anyone does need to hop off, thank you for joining us. But Loretta will be staying around to answer questions. So we will be going through the ones that are still in the Q&A. Feel free at this point to raise your hand and we can unmute you so you can ask Loretta your question directly. I do want to make a note that on the how to compost side, the PETAS is working with Santa Clara County to host a how to compost class this Saturday from 10 to 12. And I did put the registration link in the chat. So if you want to learn how to compost to supplement your garden, please join us for that class. Um, Albany, I'll let you take the lead on Q&A. All right, Loretta, thank you so much for a great presentation. And I loved your point about having fun. <laughs> so a couple questions here. Um, you touched a little bit on planting some vegetables year round, planting certain ones in fall. What are some specific easy to maintain veggies that could be planted right now? Okay, so planting right now, it's the middle of November. Um, it's um, Unless you have a very warm spot, um, um, it's going to be a little bit late. The best thing to do is, so um, you might want to go to the, um, uh, to the nursery and see what they have. But typical fall crops right now that are pretty easy to grow are chard, what we call a cool weather stuff, right? Chard, kale, spinach, um, mustard greens, lettuce, 
all kinds of lettuce. Um, let's see, what else do I have in my own yard? Um, that's what I have. And, and it's a little bit late to, to put the onions in right now. But those leaf crops, you may be able to, um, if you want to plant them right now, you might, be, you might get some. You, you, you might be able to get um, a, a decent crop. What's happening right now is the days are getting shorter, so we're having less light, and the, um, the weather is getting cooler, okay? So um, things will tend to grow more slowly than they will in the, in the summertime. But the, those cool weather leaf crops, um, we might still be able to get them in the ground right now if, over Thanksgiving. Awesome, good to know. Um, we have a couple questions about raised beds. The first one is, um, what type of wood should they be made of? Ah, okay. So raised beds, the best raised beds are made out of redwood. <laughs> okay, those are also the most expensive beds. Um, the the beds that we may that we put together at um, at Pacifica Garden um, are all um, raised beds. I mean, are, is all redwood. Um, the um, uh, probably the second best in terms of um, in terms of wood would be fir. Okay, isn't going to last as long, but fir um, will also do really well. Okay, things that you want to avoid, and I really want to emphasize this, is pressure treated wood. Okay, so sometimes we'll think, oh, pressure treated wood, that's going to be great. It'll last long. The pressure treat, even though the pressure treated uh, um, chemicals are getting less and less toxic, it's still something that I would avoid uh, making a, a garden bed with. Um, you can also make um, uh, raised beds out of um, bricks, of, um, um, you can make them out of the concrete blocks. Uh, we've made beds, I, I, like um, we showed you, we made beds out of um, urbanite, as we like to call it, um, concrete, stacked them up. So those are some ideas. Great. I'm glad to hear that there's a selection of options that could <laughs> vary based on price and availability. That's awesome. Uh -huh. um, a second question on raised beds, how tall should they be? Ah, good question. So how tall? So if you have gophers, okay, if, you, if one of the reasons why you are raising your beds is that you want to um, keep the gophers out, they need to be um, at least like um, a, a, a foot or more, okay? Anything shorter than a foot, like if you just wanna raise beds, like a six inch raised bed, that, that's not gonna keep your gophers out. So um, at least a foot. Um, uh, the ones that we built at Pacific Gardens, the ones that I have in my own yard are 18 inches high. Okay, that's just kind of like a standard. Just keep in mind the taller or the, the higher the bed, the more soil it's going to take to fill it. Now, if you want to make a, um, the, um, the ADA, Americans with Disability Act compliant beds, there's specific requirements for those. I believe they are 30 inches tall. Um, and that, and we have uh, six of those at the garden, and I can tell you they're, they're great, um, but they took a lot of soil to fill. So um, keeping the go for keeping the gophers out, I would say 18 inches would do it, no less than 12 inches, right? And then um, taller as you need, okay? But also to take into consideration the fact that the taller the bed is, the more exposure the sides are to the air, and the more water loss that will be, okay? So it be, sort of becomes like a container. So hopefully that helps, 18 inches minimum. Perfect, okay, good. Sounds like there's a couple factors that play in there. Um, moving to non-raised beds, how deep do you have to double dig in a non-raised bed? 24 inches. <laughs> so I, um, uh, if you look at the, um, uh, the resources page of the presentation, there is a book by a man named John Jevons who has been developing the grow biointensive method for about 50 years. In that book, and you can probably even Google it too, somebody's probably uploaded it. In fact, you can go to his website as well. He has a whole video on how to double dig. 
And, um, and so this is a very systematic way of, of digging down 24 inches. Right, what we're gonna essentially be doing is um, digging 12 inches and then loosening the 12 inches below and then and then and then stepping back another 12 inches and it's sort of hard to describe but anyway it's it, it's um, um, it's the way that we used to dig all of our beds but the the 24 inches for the first time out is really important. Um, after that it becomes less and after the soil um, becomes, um, loosened and is, um, isn't as compact and you get more organic matter in, you'll have to do less and less of that double digging. Double digging. Awesome. 24 inches, is, inches it is. Mm -hmm. um, yep. <laughs> on the same topic of digging, um, what tools would you recommend to dig the soil easily? Not just for double digging, but for digging in general. Yeah, great. <laughs> Um, so I use, um, and uh, this is the, um, uh, going to be a brand name, so I apologize, uh, but it's a Jackson and Spear. Um, they have, um, their digging tools. They have a digging fork and it is four prongs. You can get it as a stainless steel or as, um, um, just, um, regular steel. And uh, it's a short handle with a, a um, with a D, um, handle, um, and they also make a spade as well. These tools are a little on the pricey side, um, but um, they will last probably your lifetime if you take care of them. Um, they're um, great for uh, digging either in the ground or if you have to dig your raised beds as well. Those are the only ones I use. And when you're, when you're buying tools, I always say buy the, the best quality that you can afford. Um, because the inexpensive um, tools, not only spades and forks, um, they really don't last very long. And at the end of the day, um, you, you eventually spend more buying inexpensive tools than buying good quality ones. So, um, but I would get a digging fork um, and a digging spade. And those are both going to be relatively short handled. They're like 33 inches, 34 inches, and 30, I think you can get different lengths, and they'll have a D handle um, at the end. Great, thank you for the tip. Uh, we do have a live question, so okay. I'm going to allow you to unmute and speak. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Anyone there? If your name is iPad, or if your Zoom name is saying iPad, then if you'd like to ask your question now, go ahead. It looks like you're still muted. Oh, there she goes. There he goes. Feel free to ask your question. Okay, I guess maybe it was um, maybe it was a mis uh, mistake of the the raised hand. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we do have another raised hand by Raj, so I'm going. Okay. Um, to unmute Raj. So Raj, you are now allowed to talk. You just have to unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's very helpful. Uh, quick question about the compost. Like, uh, uh, is, what, when is the best time to uh, add compost to your soil? Like, what time period of the year, and how often we should compost? Add compost. Okay. So, um, I would add the compost to the soil. Um, a, you know, a couple of days before you're ready to plant it. Okay. Um, if you um, add it to, to the bed and don't plant anything for a while, um, you end up um, sort of um, leaving the soil bare and open to the elements. So um, we always just put our compost in just before we're ready to plant and uh, cover the bed and protect the soil and the compost. And um, 
and then and then um, and then and then plant as soon as you can. Now, um, how often do you need it? Usually, if you're if you're just gonna plant um, one, like your if you're just gonna plant, say your win your summer crops, adding it once at the very beginning of the season is fine. If you're gonna plant, say, some fall crops, some cabbages or broccoli in the fall, then you'll add it again. Okay, it's just before you plant. Does that help? Oh yes, thank you. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, how, how do we know uh, we are not overusing the compost? I'm sorry, can you re no. repeat your question? Uh, uh, like, uh, how, how do we know that like we are not over uh, using the compost? Like, is that, how do we know like exact, like, uh, does, does, does it affect the soil quality if you over, overuse the compost? Yeah, exactly. So um, um, I, that's why I put in that presentation like half an inch to one inch. Okay, so that's usually that's just a that's a that's a guess. So if you think that if your soil has not been amended for a while, you can probably get away with an inch. Okay, if you've if you've been working and and planting your vegetable garden for a while and you've been trying to improve your soil, the half inch is probably enough. The one thing that you don't want to do is like you as you've mentioned is go in there and put you know four inches of compost in, in into the bed. Okay, that would be a little bit too much. There is a point of diminishing return, so to speak. You think like oh more compost is is going to be better, but that's not actually true okay but if you you should be safe at about an inch thank you mm -hmm. great thank you raj for your questions thank you so um moving on we have about 10 minutes left and a couple more questions okay. um oh actually we do have another live question it looks like let's see okay sdr go ahead You still have to uh, unmute yourself. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I am a, a new gardener, and you had mentioned wanting to make sure you cover the beds in the winter. So I have not yet built my beds. I'm planning to do it this winter uh, in preparation for the spring. Um, but you mentioned wanting to protect them during the winter. Are you, I, I mean, I, I know you mentioned one of the things you can do is cover it with mulch, but then you want to plant again in the spring. So what do you, I think I'm missing a step. What do you do with if I cover it with mulch in the winter, then then what do I do in the spring? Where do I put the mulch? Does that, does that question make sense? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's fine. So if you if you build your beds during the winter, and and you you know you put your soil in there, okay. Um, depending on when you do it, you might actually be able to get a uh, um, get a, a legume cover crop and get it planted in there, which would be, which would be great. But if you can't, then put your leaves over it and mulch it. And then when you're ready to plant, right? So it'll be about two or three months, right? Before um, you, you, you're able to plant. All you're gonna do is take your fork and you're just going to very gently um, uh, turn in your leaves, right? Into the, into the soil. And that will add extra carbon uh, to your soil. Then you can add more compost if you want, if you if you need to, and then go ahead and plant your plants. All right, and then um, and then you can mulch after that again if you have some straw or if you still have some extra leaves. Then you then you'll sort of do a second application of of mulch. Okay, great. Thank you. That. That, uh, does that, that help? Thanks for me. It does. Thank you. Like I said, very huh? beginner gardener, so I uh, have some pretty pretty basic questions. Thank no you. problem. Mm -hmm. All right, we have another question from Raj, so I'm going to allow you to speak, Raj. Go ahead mm -hmm. whenever you're ready. Thank you so much for uh, this. Is my second question uh, about mulching. Um, so. Would you recommend any particular mulch uh, type of trees is good for the ground or any type of uh, mulch, tree mulch is good? Um, so generally you're going to be fine with just about, I say that just about anything, okay? 
<laughs> except for um, um, so our the, the best leaves are going to be like your maple leaves or your um, your oak leaves um, other leaves that um, will decompose uh, fairly um, easily the magnolia leaves are kind of tough um, I usually just um, I didn't usually use those when I had magnolia trees um, pine needles are fine um, let's see what else. I'm not sure what else you have um, laying around, uh, I, but um, no, I mean, like the tree company, like you buy in bulk, like you know, sometimes they drop it, drop it off in bulk. Oh, are you talking about chips? Chips, sorry. Ah, okay. So okay. Chips as a, once. Yes. Oh, okay, chips. Okay. So um, uh, you want to stay away from uh, um, eucalyptus. Okay. <laughs> Um, and you want to, I don't know if you're going to get very much walnut, but you want to stay away from walnut as well. Okay. But your, um, your pine and your cypress, um, those, those are fine. Um, the thing about, um, using, um, chips, okay. Chips are great, uh, for paths and we, um, chip our orchard all the time. But chips are very, very high carbon. Um, the carbon nitrogen ratio in chips is like one um, uh, um, nitrogen to 400 or 450 carbon. So it's going to be, um, I don't usually use chips to mulch my vegetable beds. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll use the chips to mulch the orchard. Okay. So if you can find something else to mulch your vegetable beds, you're going to be better off. Like just, you can just get a, a, um, a bale or a half a bale or a partial bale of straw and you can use the straw for mulching your vegetable beds. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, our next live question is coming from Carrie. Carrie, okay. go ahead whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. Yes, I had a question about uh, peas for growing. I guess they're, uh, are they just spring or can you plant them now or am I a little too late? I, I saved seeds from uh, the plants that I had last year. Okay. So I wondered if I could plant them now and how, um, how deep I would plant them. I've done it before, but I can't remember. Okay, okay. Um, it's, um, it, it's November, it's, it's a little bit late. Um, you, probably would have, you probably would have gotten them if you'd gotten them in, in, um, uh, in September. But um, if you wanna try a few, um, that's you know, completely up, up um, um, it's completely up to you. So, um, when you, when you, so you, you save seed, so really they only need to go in the ground or in the flat, um, probably about like a half an inch or, um, you know, maybe just a little bit more, about three quarters of an inch. Don't plant them very deep. Okay. And then um, uh, they, um, they should sprout, all right. They should germinate in um, about five or six days, maybe a little bit longer because it's getting cooler. It depends on where you're putting them. You may want to bring them inside to let them uh, germinate. Um, but um, just know if you try it now, it might not work. So you might want to just hold off and wait. Um, peas are a cool weather crop. So in your area, Milpitas, Sunnyvale area, they are, you're, they're going to do best. Um, if you plant them in like late February, early March before it gets too hot. So that's what, you know, try them if you want, um, but it's probably getting um, a little bit uh, too cold and not enough daylight for them right now. I better just stay. Uh, I think before when I put the plants in October, one location I got some peas and then the rest, the other ones didn't come until they just held off all winter and then they came in the spring. That's exactly so, right. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So I'm better off just waiting. Now, do, do you soak yep. them? When I did it before with seeds, I soaked them, but I don't remember for how long before. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, sometimes I soak things and sometimes I don't, depends on, on kind of the hurry that I'm in. Um, but you can um, just soak them for 24 hours um, and then uh, they'll, they'll plump up and you can sow um, and then you can plant them then. Okay. So maybe I'll but, just. And thank you. For yeah. Okay. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.
Okay, we've got a couple more minutes and a couple more questions. Okay. Um, so we have a question about um, if I build a box and I use stilts to raise it, what is the best thing to use on the bottom? Oh, okay. Ah, uh, all right. So this is um, a box, uh, a planting box that has, so it's going to be relatively short. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can build, um, so building a box out of two by fours, um, I'm guessing you could also use redwood fencing, depends, um, but you may need to um, reinforce it with a couple of two by four crossbars. I hope that makes sense, okay? Um, yeah, that, that's a planter, okay? Um, so the planter is gonna fall, and so that planter is gonna fall into the whole parameter of a, um, uh, of a container garden. So the soil that you put in there is going to need to be, you know, get the um, uh, um, soil that is good for container gardens or container or pots and then you'll have to act, um, um, add extra um, uh, compost to that. And maybe depending on what you're planting in there, you're gonna need to add um, a little bit of organic fertilizer as well. They're a little bit, um, they're much easier to, they're easy to work in, um, but they're a little bit of a challenge in terms of optimizing um, the crop growth, okay? But if uh, that's what you want to do, then I would on the bottom. You just need to make sure that whatever you put on the bottom, either fir or redwood, there's a that there's enough space for the uh, for the water to drain out. Um, and if you if possible, make sure it's a porous surface so that the water doesn't drain. It goes down into the aquifer. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so we are at 8.30, but Loretta, do you have time for another question or two, perhaps? Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, so on the same note of soil, um, can I reuse my old soil again next year? And if yes, do I need to add anything to it? Yes and yes. Um, <laughs> so if you, um, uh, if you use soil from... Um, are we, are, I'm assuming that we're talking about containers. Um, yes, um, um, depending on what it, what it is, if you purchase the nice um, topsoil, absolutely. You want, you want your soil to be, the, the soil situation to be ongoing and as permanent as possible. And I would add um, either homemade compost to it or um, a good quality organic purchased comp compost. And, um, and then depending on what, what, what you're planting, you may need to add a little alfalfa meal um, or, um, or a good um, vegetable organic fertilizer. Wonderful, thank you. Um, if I plant, or do you suggest planting certain things around the boundary of a bed to deter pests? Perhaps something like chili? <laughs> yeah, so there's a whole, there's another whole conversation about, um, about uh, planting, companion planting, and um, planting uh, different plants to attract beneficial insects and to um, kind of create a more of an ecological um, garden. Um, um, I really enjoy planting herbs at the end, or what we call aromatic herbs at the ends of my beds. Sometimes I will plant onions, um, bunching onions um, at, the, at the ends of my beds uh, to um, ward off different things. Um, I, chili, um, chili doesn't grow in my climate, so I don't plant any peppers whatsoever, but using um, those types of systems, I think one are fun. Um, we get a whole variety of things that um, in the garden and, and, and they'll also help attract um, beneficial insects as well. So to answer your question, yes. <laughs> And about a month ago, we also had a workshop on integrated pest management. So if you're interested in learning more about that, it should be available on the Bosco website. Great. 
So a couple more questions for you, Loretta. Mm -hmm. um, with fruit trees, what things are needed to do from now until January? Do we need to do trimming, fertilizing? What do you suggest? Uh, so if you have, um, if you have um, mature trees right now, you're going to be rolling into um, the end of the season. Um, and uh, in uh, January, when the trees, uh, January, early February, uh, that's when they need to be pruned. Okay, so if you're gonna if you're gonna do any um, pruning of the trees, um, wait till the leaves fall off, and you'll be um, uh, pruning them in January or early February, and then just as the um, watch the leaves and uh, or uh, watch the leaves, watch the watch the tree, and right about the time their break dormancy. Um, there, that's when the, that's the first time that you'll, you'll need to fertilize them. So that probably won't be until, well, who knows these days, but late February or early March. Um, and then you'll need to fertilize, um, uh, when the fruit gets, is set. So, um, and that will, depending on what kind of tree it is, um, and what kind of fruit it is, probably somewhere around late, um, May, sometimes early May, or even June if it's a late fruit. So right now, just finish up your harvest, um, make sure that the tree stays watered, and um, and then and then you'll do your pruning in um, uh, you'll do your pruning um, in January or February. <clears throat> Hopefully that helps. Yes, it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we'll take these last two questions in the Q and A. Um, for compost labeled as hot, can it be used right away? And if I want to use something ASAP, what can we do about it? Oh, uh, compost labeled hot, you mean as in like manure? <clears throat> I believe so. Okay, yes. Okay, so, so um, the um, hot manure needs to, um, needs, needs to decompose, okay? So um, you're looking at a couple of months. If you put um, a hot manure or uncomposted manure into a bed, um, it will um, it will kill your plants. So uh, if you have a, a, a pile of manure, I don't know what kind of manure we're talking about, um, but um, put it on like create a pile for it and um, and just let it compost. Okay, and um, you know, um, you can put it in a composter too if you want, but it, it, it's going to need to mature. Okay, it will need it will need to mature. What I like to do if I have manure and um, at the big garden, we um, very often we will get a combination of manure and straw, goat manure and straw from the 4-H, which is just across the field from us, and we incorporate it into the our composting system. So our compost usually takes three months to mature, three to four months. So I take that, I take that manure and straw and I combine it with the other um, crop residue that we're getting from the garden and I put it in the piles itself. And, um, and in three months, it's totally fine. But if you don't do that, you're still gonna need to let it age um, at least three months. Otherwise, um, you will burn your plants. Good to know. Thank you. Um, so our final question of the night, last but not least, um, Loretta, could you please tell us a little bit about making your own liquid fertilizer from kitchen waste items? Ah, <laughs> kitchen waste items, <laughs> liquid fertilizer. Um, I don't actually do that. Um, I know that you can, but what I do, I make liquid fertilizer. Um, I can, I've done it before um, uh, from, from my worm bin, okay? So we have a worm bin and we have composters. And so we um, take the kitchen scraps, we let the worms eat it. And then from the worm um, castings, um, we, have a little, um, we have a little net and we throw some castings in there and then we put it in a five gallon bucket and we let the, um, the nutrients from the worm castings sort of dissolve in the bucket and then we apply that afterwards um i like i said i i don't 
take uncomposted or un sort of worm worm <laughs> worm castings um, and make uh, and, and and make um, fertilizer from it. So. I don't and know. one note, hopefully that helps. Oh, <laughs> I have to say one note on that, mm -hmm. that the Santa Clara County has held a class on um, how they do the vermicomposting as well. So um, you can check out the, that recording about how to compost with worms. Yeah, worm composting is really a perfect way to just take your um, kitchen scraps take them outside, put them in the, the composting bin and let the worms go crazy. And then, you know, in a little bit, you have either uh, fertilizer, your own fertilizer, you don't have to buy anything, or you can take it and like I said, you know, steep it in, um, in water and make compost tea. And then you can put it on your trees or your vegetable garden or whatever. It's, uh, it, it's actually, um, the, I, I love the verm, the vermiculture. It's, it's excellent. I don't see any other questions in the Q and A, and I know it is now eight forty. So Albini, I would both like to thank everyone who's attended tonight, and thank you so much, Loretta, for the presentation. We will provide um, Loretta's email of Pacifica Gardens if you have any follow up questions. And as mentioned earlier, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Bosco website. Thank you so much, everyone. Please join us for the last um, class of the season on rainwater harvesting. Thank you, everybody.